boys and girls. I'm back today with our Gordon Corman Hypnotist. We are on chapter 15. This one has like a title right at the beginning of the chapter. It says, Wash, Coin, Op, Laundry, open 365 days a year. So he's obviously at the laundromat. Jack stared at the sign to the business card in his hand and back again. This was definitely the right address. Inside, customers shuffled, stuffed bundles of clothes into industrial washers and dryers. A few sat on benches, reading magazines and fiddling with phones, waiting impatiently for loads to finish. He checked his watch, 8.10. There was no meeting going on and definitely no meeting of hypnotists. Why would Axel Braintree browbeat him into attending a gathering at the Sandman's Guild and then send him to the wrong place? Was Braintree such a flake that he honestly couldn't remember the location of his own meeting? Maybe the whole thing was just a joke. But if so, there was nobody around to enjoy the payoff. Jax looked up and down 7th Avenue. No sign of the old guy with the ponytail. Jax watched, watched as a young, twitchy man entered Easy Wash carrying no laundry bag or basket, his hands jammed inside the pouch of his hoodie, glancing around over his shoulder. He lifted the lid and peered inside of one of the washers, only to be shouted away by a lady with a toy poodle in her lap. He spun around, raises, raising his arms in a gesture of innocence, and darted down the back hall. He was followed a few minutes later by a very tall woman in a, volum in a voluminous trench coat. She made no pretense of being the customer, sweeping by the machines, disappearing to the bend of the rear corridor. Self-consciously, Jack stepped inside and made his way to the back. There was no sign except a small message board that read of ice in an uneven magnetic letter. Le letters. There's three letters in ice. There were two doors off the short hall. One provided access to the Stone Age bathroom. Jacks could hear muffled voices coming from behind the other. There was an open crack and he pressed his face to the jam and peered inside. He spotted Braintree's pink face and gray ponytail almost immediately. About 15 people sat in a circle on folding bridge chairs. Jax wasn't sure what he'd expected of a professional organization of hypnotists to look like. Magicians, maybe psychics, shamans, or maybe sorcerers. But the collection of the individuals in Braintree's guild seemed closer to the crowd you'd encounter, encounter hanging out overnight at a bus station than a group of shared, rare, and powerful supernatural talent. A few had come straight from work in suits and business attire. There was a mom who carried a sleeping infant in a baby bjorn. In general, though, this seemed like a scruffy crew. The clothes were ill-matched and ragged, shoes were scuffed and worn, ripped jeans, unshaven faces. I haven't bent anyone for 17 weeks, a stocky 30-something man with bright red hair announced in a smattering of applause. Excellent, Ivan, Braintree approved. Except my landlady, Ivan finished. The ovation died abruptly. Well, I had to. If she doesn't believe my apartment is rent controlled, I won't be able to afford to live there anymore. Using your power to pay less for something is the same as using it to swindle a steal. Or steal, the old man lectured, ponytail bobbing earnestly. I'm not going to hobbleskin. And Ivan stated flatly, we all have a gift. Braintree lectured but we have to resist the temptation to use our abilities for, for, for personal gain. There's a deep, deeper satisfaction that comes from making an honest living. Look at Evelyn. She's waitressing now. The tall woman with the trench coat stood up. I got fired, she admitted shamefaced. There were complaints. Hematism isn't going to keep you from spilling soup on somebody, Ivan commiser commiserated. She shook her head. It wasn't that. It was my tips. They were... Large. Braintree sighed. You didn't. People are so cheap, she complained. I just made a little suggestion. 15%. Is that too much to ask for? It's not my fault that one guy signed over his life insurance policy. What kind of idiot tracks life insurance policy into the restaurant tab? What kind of idiot brings insurance into a restaurant in the first place? There's no such thing as a little suggestion the old man explained patiently. Hypnotizing for a penny is no different than hypnotizing for a million. In that case, the mom said sourly, I should just go back to Wall Street. 
Wall Street is the worst hotbed of misguided mesmerism anywhere, Braintree warned. Don't risk it. You have a wonderful family. It's what you and your husband dreamed of. What he thought he dreamed of, anyway, she amended. The old man raised his arms to quell a babble of conversation. Sandmen. We're not all sand men, Evelyn put in. I happen to be a sand woman. In fact, I move that we change the name to the Sand Persons Guild. We've been through this before, Evelyn. We consider everyone, male or female, an equal Sandman. Plus, we're a support group, not the local order of the water buffaloes. We don't make motions. We're just here to help one another gravel with special abilities that we that can be really tempting to abuse sometimes. And for free donuts, added a voice near the back. They cut our donuts last November, the mom said mournfully. In a groundswell of discontinuing murmuring, two salmon got up and headed for the exit. Braintree watched in exasperation as his members numbers dwindled until he noticed the newcomer outside the door. Jax felt the familiar stirring soon becoming a tugging. The president of the Sandman Guild was locking into his gaze. I believe we have a visitor. Sheepishly, Jax stepped into the room. I was in the neighborhood. Jackson Opus. To the others he put in, you recognize the name, of course. Opus? Call me Jax. I hope I'm not interrupting anything important. Welcome, welcome. Jax has been working with Dr. Mako uptown. I invited him here so he could see other, the other inside of the manhole cover. The other side of the manhole cover was not pretty. While Santa was a respected organization supported by some of the wealthiest, most accomplished, and most famous figures in the world, the Sandman's Guild was a ragtag coffee clash minus the coffee. The contrast could not have been more obvious. The Institute occupied the top three floors of a beautiful building in the upper post part of New York City. The Guild knelt in the back room of a laundromat. Dr. Mako and Miss Samuels could have shared the cover of GQ magazine. Axel Braintree looked like an ex-hippie turned Walmart greeter. Most glaring of all, Santa was a research lab dedicated to harnessing mesmeric powers for the good of all humanity. The Guild was a gaggle of two-bit con artists trying to kick the habit of bidding unsuspecting marks and falling for sleazy scams. That began to sink in as the various members introduced themselves. Ivan Markiko was a former electronic salesman who was fired for being too good at his job. He had a knack for convincing customers to buy expensive TVs they didn't want or need. It was the next day returns that did him in. Evelyn Lotus did used to make her living winning beauty contests until her picture in the paper excited too many letters of a complaint accusing the panel of either bias or blurred vision. The judges were easy to hypnotize, but it was impossible to reach everybody who read the papers. There was a bank teller who persuaded depositors to leave with a little less money than they withdrew, and a juror consultant who was having entirely too much fun with the outcome of the trials. There was a panhandler who was getting diamond rings and Rolex watches tossed into his hat, and 98-pound arm wrestler who had never lost a match. Even Braintree himself was a former abuser of his gift, and not for small potatoes. He had actually spent time in prison for art theft. He would bend museum security into not noticing that he was stuffing paintings and small sculptures under his raincoat. Even in jail, he managed to gain favors and privileges by mesmerizing the guards. At his parole hearing, he'd hypnotize the entire board into granting him early release. Don't you see? The old man's face was even pinker than usual in his sincerity. I thought the rules didn't apply to me because of my power over people's minds. Even when I was caught and punished, I found a way to wheel out of it through hypnotism. I was young and foolish, and I was going back into society to make some mistakes all over again. How did you stop yourself? Jax asked, interested in spite of the discomfort of these revelations for bringing to him. On the bus home from prison, I tried to bend the driver into letting me on without paying. That's how arrogant I was. I wouldn't hand over 50 cents to avoid doing what had gotten me arrested in the first place. But it didn't work. The driver was a fellow Sandman and a powerful one. Before I knew it, I was dropping coins in the fare box happily. It seemed like the most natural thing in the world. When I was back to myself, I asked him how come a guy with his gift was driving a bus. He could be making millions in Vegas or on Wall Street, playing it 99% straight, beating the odds with just a little bit of hypnotism. And he clicked two quarters from his coin belt and held them out to me. You want a free ride? You think it's free? 
In that moment, Braintree went on. I saw what my future would be like if I took that money. Fifty lousy cents, but it was the difference between living a decent life and being a crook forever. It's been 30 years since that day, and I'm proud to announce that I haven't bent a penny out of anyone. The guild broke into spontaneous applause. Jax couldn't help noticing that there were a lot of moist eyes in the room, not to mention more than a few shamed expressions. Maybe Axel Braintree had been on the wagon for three decades, but some members could count the time since their last transaction in hours and possibly minutes. But what does this have to do with Dr. Mako? Jax probed. He's not like that at all. The goal of Sienta is to make the world a better place. That's what he wants you to think, Braintree corrected. That's what everybody thinks, Jax insisted. Do you have any idea how many big shots and celebrities support Santa? When my family first met Dr. Mako, guess who was coming out of his office while we were going in? Senator Trey Douglas, a guy who could be our next president. If he trusts Dr. Mako, why don't you? Senator Douglas is a politician, not a Sandman. Look, I get it, Jack said, becoming annoyed. If you guys didn't have your little support group meetings, you'd be out here bending blackjack dealers and buying iPads for nickel and the hypnotizing the clerks at the Apple store. Well, just because you have to wrestle with temptation to rip people doesn't mean Dr. Mako does. The old man sighed heavily. Let's assume for a minute that you're right. Dr. Mako is telling the truth and he intends to use power for only good. What would that good be exactly? Well, Jack straw blank. At the Institute, the hypnos made their special subjects jump, laugh, cry, and scratch non-existent itches. It was hard to see how ma human mankind could benefit from that. Of course, it was just training to prepare for the real thing, which no one had ever spoken much about. Exactly what was the real thing? I don't know, Jack admitted finally. But it seems to me that if you can use hypnotism to influ influence really bad gangsters or evil dictators into becoming a better person, that would be good for the world, wouldn't it? It would, Braintree agreed. If it worked, which it wouldn't, there's no standing alive who can change what is in somebody's heart. You can make a gangster call off a hit, but if you try to convince a violent man that killing is wrong, it may work for a day, a week, even a month. Sooner or later, though, the suggestion were what will wear off. Maybe that's the whole point of Sienta, Jax argued, to develop a new approach. You look at the power as something that has to be controlled to keep it from being abused. And that's fine. I can see that you're doing a lot of great things around the, uh, laundromat. But Dr. Mako sees it as something wonderful, like the invention of the wheel or the discovery of electricity, something that can be revolutionized into the world. Just because we haven't figured out how to do that doesn't mean that we should stop trying. Braintree regarded him with new respect. You're a smart kid. You're not going to rejigger what you believe on my say-so, but that should go for Dr. Mako as well. Do you honestly believe that he has no idea that you carry Sparks' blood as well as Opus? Why would he keep this from you? Do you think he's afraid to let you find out how powerful you may be? Me? Compared to Dr. Mako? I don't even come up to his ankles. My point exactly, Braintree jumped in. You don't have the experience to make sense of everything that's going on in the Institute. Let me be your guide. Tell me everything that's happening over there and I can interpret it for you. Jax was outraged. That's not you being a guide. That's you being a spy. If you want to put it that way, the guild leader acknowledged. But if Mako's as clean as you say, then he can stay in the inspection. Jack stood up. I'm sorry I came here. You're nothing but a bunch of cheap con men, and you got the nerve to dump all over Dr. Mako, who has developed his life to New York City's education and is an inspir- He caught himself. Well, he's a better person than all of you put together. He stormed out of the laundromat into the darkening streets of Greenwich Village. All right, we're on to chapter 16. So Jack showed up at the laundromat for the Sandman's Guild meeting. Um, seems like they're a little different of a bunch, but it seems like maybe they're trying to say that maybe Dr. Mako isn't completely honest. <sighs> I'm tired. All right, guys. Keep listening. Chapter 16's up next. Bye.